Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, doctor, disease knows no borders or boundaries. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's correct. That's how we use the phrase that disease, diseases know no boundaries and a threat anywhere could be a threat everywhere. So even though uh, the, your, in answer to the chairman's question, you said it's a low risk right now, obviously a greater outbreak of the Ebola virus produces a greater risk, just one flight away, right, from someone who's contaminated before they show the symptoms. Yes, sir. Some of the things we look at are the transmission dynamics in the area and what the uh, response capability is and also what the travel patterns are from the areas of the outbreak. So that's something we're constantly My point assessing. in just raising that is that this is about more than being a good uh, global partner. Uh, we have self-interest here uh, as well. So uh, um, it seems to me that the major obstacle to uh, containing the Ebola outbreak in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo appears to be the lack of adequate access to the affected communities. And the decades of insecurity coupled with political marginalization has resulted in conditions where not only are healthcare workers unable to reach areas subject to militia attack, uh, the very communities that, are trying to have, that we're trying to have access to have rejected health interventions, uh, even attacking and killing healthcare workers. The U.S. intervention in West Africa during the Ebola crisis of 2014 was, I think, instrumental in stopping its spread. However, in the DRC, the U.S. has to date been unable to provide a full suite of interventions. The administration, for example, refused for months to issue a waiver for sanctions imposed on the DRC as a result of the DRC's Tier 3 ranking under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Uh, USAID briefed committee staff in May on plans for engaging with communities to assess basic needs they may have in addition to Ebola, both in the healthcare sector and beyond as an improved strategy for gaining access to these communities. It's no good to have, uh, you go to a, a healthcare center, you may not have Ebola, but you have some other significant disease and you can't be treated. People don't necessarily find that a reason then to go. Uh, so. Actions that until very recently could not be fully uh, undertaken due to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act sanctions, which were never really meant for that purpose uh, as one of those who were fully engaged in the TVPA. So let me, which brings me to my questions. Uh, Admiral, uh, is any of the fiscal year 2018 funding that was being held by the administration now being used to fund USAID's strategy to go beyond the health sector so as to provide health workers with better access to these communities? Yeah, Senator, thanks for the question. And first of all, I just want to thank you and the other members for your strong support in this area. It's very much appreciated. Uh, the current investment that has been made by the U.S. government and USAID, the $136 million, has not been affected by uh, TVPA. I believe you and your staff are aware of that. The interagency is reviewing the uh, implication of TVPA, particularly uh, as a result of this outbreak and the implications, not only in uh, DRC, but also in Burundi and South Sudan, which are on the Tier 3 list. And uh, we expect uh, to hear a resolution on that uh, very, very soon. And uh, we'll keep you and your staff posted. So, so 2018 funding that was being held, is it being used now or not? Uh, no, sir, not all of it. Not all of it. So how long is it going to take for money for those activities to reach the ground? As soon as we get the disposition on the uh, decision, uh, the funding and release of the funding, then... Uh, and that's still being held up because of determining whether or not uh, the TVPA is going to continue to affect them? Yes, sir. And oh, that, that's, that's, that's not acceptable. Uh, is there fiscal year 2018 money that is being reprogrammed out of the DRC, to your knowledge? Or uh, Secretary Nagy? I don't, I don't know, Senator. I, I can certainly check on it, but I Admiral, don't know. do you know if there is? No, but we'll double check the specifics and get back to you. Uh, has fiscal 19 money been approved for Ebola response activities? Uh, on the IDA account, uh, we're continuing to expend funding. Well, I'd like to, uh, not to dwell on it right now, but I'd like to get the administration's response to us about 
The Trafficking Victims Protection Act was meant not to ensure that countries, you know, were doing the right things in terms of making sure they weren't trafficking in persons, but it certainly wasn't meant to withhold money in a health emergency like this. That was never envisioned by the Congress, and I, I hope we can get to that. I know that some of us are offering language to make that clear for now and in the future, but in the interim, we can't wait for the, for the Ebola virus uh, to break out even more significantly before we respond to it. Let me ask you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, what effect did the cancellation of elections have in terms of further straining relations between Kinshasa and the disenfranchised communities and areas affected by Ebola? The uh, Eastern DRC wasn't that uh, significantly affected by the elections. The one that you're referring, sir, to the ones that were won by uh, Chisikedi mm -hmm. that, that led to him. The, there was not any serious election, post-election violence there. Unfortunately, that had always been a disaffected region of the DRC. The population there for decades has been uh, very cynical about political developments. Luckily, President Chisikedi is the first president to have actually visited now the Ebola region. He's been there several times to get the local authorities dynamized to confront it. So his image has really gone up since the inauguration and since his presidency. There, is there any impact about our endorsement of Mr. Chinchikadi's questionable victory had on the credibility and our ability to undertake the full range of Ebola-related uh, activities in Eastern Congo? Uh, Senator, from my information and from talking to uh, Ambassador Hammer, it's, uh, it's been just the opposite. Uh, the United States image has uh, actually been much improved because uh, post-election, President Chisikadi's popularity goes up and up. Yeah. Let me ask you this. On July 2nd, the DRC's Minister of Health, uh, Oli Laguna, resigned in protest over President Chisikadi's decision to take over the Ebola response. By all accounts, she was an effective administrator, a good interlocutor. Uh, how does the resignation affect the Ebola response? Uh, you mentioned there will be a new health minister at some point, but when do we expect that to happen? Uh, and uh, why has this taken place when you have somebody who seemed to be working well in the job? Senator, my, my colleagues may be able to chime in also on the technical parts of this, but the president did not have confidence in the health minister. There was going to be a new one anyway, so he brought the whole Ebola issue to the presidency's office by appointing a coordinating committee. Uh, I think I, I mentioned, uh, headed by Dr. Moyembe, who has Ebola expertise going back to 1976. Mm -hmm. So right now the Ebola is still being directed out of the presidency. And the truth be told, it's been going on for over a year, so the previous health minister has not been all that effective. Mm -hmm. So we, do, we didn't consider her effective or a good interlocutor? Uh, I think she was a good interlocutor, but as far as the, the, the results, I think, for the effectiveness speak for themselves. Sir. Last question. So we're all in with Shinja Katie, then? We're very guardedly optimistic, and if you would uh, like I have for the record, I'd be happy to submit a list of President Chisikati's positive accomplishments since uh, assuming office, sir. That's not my question. We're all in with Shinja Katie. For, for now, we are. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir.